Okay, well, good morning once again, everyone. And today, and thank you, Dennis and May, for leading us. Uh, today, friends, we're going to be in Psalm 118. That's a very, very important psalm, Psalm 118. And again, I don't want to rush through it because every verse is beautiful and jam-packed, solid, and overflowing with meaning. So this will be Psalm 118, part one today. If you can locate Psalm 118. It's referenced in the New Testament, definitely a messianic psalm, but let's, let's get into it here. Psalm 118, verse 1. The psalmist writes, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The psalmist tells us that the Lord is good. And you and I know, based on our study of the scriptures, that he, he really is the only one who is good. In his nature and character, intrinsically, God is good. God is good because God is love. Surely the greatest of ethics, love. 1 John 4, 8 and 16, God is love. He is love incarnate. And you remember uh, in Mark chapter 10, we had this man run up to Jesus, and he said, good teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Good teacher, what, what good thing should I do? And Jesus replied to this man, and it's a little shocking what he said to him. Do you remember? He said, why do you call me good? There's none good but one that is God. That's a little shocking. I mean, there's no good people on the whole earth? Right. <laughs> I mean, ontologically, maybe, our source is good. That's God. Okay. But we are no longer good as we should be. Let's face it. What happened? Well, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 that God created the world in six days, and every last single solitary thing God created, he called it good. He created the light. It's good. Dry land, plants, good. He creates sea creatures and birds flying in the firmament of heaven. Good, good, good. Everything's good. And then he created man and his bride, and God performed the first marriage. It was an outdoor wedding there in the garden. Very beautiful scene. Can you imagine how beautiful it was? Father God brought daughter Eve down this garden pathway to waiting Adam. And God performed the very first marriage ceremony. And after he did that, you know what he said about the created order? Now it's very good. The individual parts were good, but now the, the whole thing is very good. That's Genesis 131. But something terrible happened. You know what it was? Original man, Adam, he was our, what, spiritual and physical progenitor, our federal head and representative. And that man, mysteriously, we don't really understand all this, but willingly, deliberately, intentionally, he transgressed the known will of God. He fell. The Bible says he fell, and um, he took us all with him. He represented us. We were there. We were in him, mysteriously, embryonically. We were there in Adam. And he fell, and we fell. And Romans 5.19 says that by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. We were made sinners on the spot in Adam. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I insist that we come into the world sort of double disasters. We have sin natures. We inherited those things from Adam. We have sin debt that we just keep accruing to ourselves. We just keep adding more and more sin debt. And Jesus looked at his disciples in that horrible condition. His disciples, mind you. This is Luke chapter 11. And he looks at his disciples and he says, you being evil, at least you know how to give good gifts to your children. This is his instruction on prayer. He said, pray to your father because he's good and he knows how to give good gifts to his children. He said, but look at you people being evil. You know how to do it. Don't you think your Heavenly Father knows how to do it? And he's good. In any case, we know that every last man, woman, and child born into the world comes into the world with, with the stain of sin. Original sin, total depravity. I believe in total depravity. If, you, if what you mean is every part of man is touched by sin, I believe it. Oh, there's one blessed exception, and that's the Lord Jesus himself. He got around that, you know, by this thing called the virgin birth. 
Jesus Christ came into the world, perfectly spotless, sinless, holy Son of God, holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, the Bible says. That's Jesus. So the Lord's reply to that man, when the man called him good, uh, good teacher, the Lord's reply was not a denial that he was God or that he was good. He's just inviting that man to think deeply about who he really, really is. Because the Lord Jesus did identify himself, didn't he, in John 10, as what? The good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, he said. And that is an epithet for God. You read the Old Testament, God is the shepherd. He's Israel's shepherd, and he's a good shepherd. The Lord wants us thinking deeply about who he is. This isn't some peripheral thing here. If we, if we transgress and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, we don't have God. You see, this is very serious. We, whatever else we may have right, if we've got Jesus wrong, it puts us outside redemption and salvation. It's very important we know who Jesus really, really is. That's Jesus questioned his apostles. He said, gentlemen, who do men say that I am? Remember Matthew 16? Who do men say that I am? And the apostles offered several things. They had all, uh, one thing in common they all had. They're all wrong, dead wrong. <laughs> and then the Lord said, well, who do you 12 say that I am? And Peter spoke for the group. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Not on Peter, but on his apostolic witness, you see. Very important. And we are the custodians of that witness, that life-saving witness to who Jesus really, really is. That makes us pretty important in the world, you know. This is a God-ordained, God-given importance that we have. We're not just here filling our time, chillaxing, (laughs) you know, sporting it, watching TV or whatever, just hanging around doing nothing, living for pleasure. No, we have a very important job to do. We are to disclose to the world who Jesus really, really is. In this first verse, we're told to give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good. Give thanks. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything give thanks. I'm supposed to give thanks in every last single solitary circumstance I find myself in? Yes. I think that's a hard thing to do. It is a hard thing to do. But men of God are called to do it. Who remembers Jonah? Remember that grumpy prophet, Jonah? (laughs) I tell people, you better obey God because you don't want to get eaten by a fish, do you? (laughs) Jonah was going down the gullet of some colossal sea monster. And as he was being ingested, you know, you know what he did? He prayed. And it's shocking. His prayer was a prayer of thanksgiving. That, you figure that would be the last thing you'd be doing. You'd be saying, oh, God, save me. But he was praying thanks. And how about Daniel? Remember Daniel the prophet out there in Babylon in exile? And in Daniel's day, the Persian king had issued a decree No one prays to anyone but me. And Daniel said, okay, that's fine, but my job description doesn't change, so I'm going up onto the upper room of my house. I'm going to open the windows facing Jerusalem, and I'm going to pray just like I always have, like nothing has changed. And you know what he prayed? He gave thanks, a prayer of thanksgiving. He didn't say, oh, God, save me from the den of lions that are waiting for me because I'm going to get caught here. No, he gave thanks. Amazing. Amazing. But you and I, friends, we're called to this attitude, and can I say it this way? We're not going to do it. We are not going to give God legitimate thanks from our hearts unless we really know and believe that everything that we're enduring is here for our good, ultimately. That's Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for good, for the good of those who, what, love God, those who are the called according to his purpose. If you really believe that in your heart of hearts, everything that's happening is being worked together for the purpose of greater goods, then you can manage to give thanks to God. But if you don't believe it, your your thanksgiving will be phony. So we say, Lord God, please make the changes in me that need to be made so that I offer you real thanks, that this isn't play acting here. I'm not just saying words, words that are vacuous of meaning. What God is calling us to, friends, is something called faith. Faith. What's faith anyhow? Faith is not a blind leap into the darkness. It's not hoping against hope that some of these things that you've chosen to believe are true. Meanwhile, you have deep suspicions they are not. That is not faith. That is not the biblical definition of it. Faith is believing what you've been persuaded is true. 
And biblical faith goes a step further, and f- biblical faith is active trust, actively trusting in someone. You know, I've seen pictures of men walking a tightrope across Niagara Falls. You ever see that? Crazy people <laughs> in the world. And then I've seen some of these guys walking across the tightrope with someone on their back. Now, you could stand there and watch somebody do this, and they reach the other side where you're standing, and now you know for sure that this man is able to do it. You believe he can do it. You know he can do it. And then he says, well, jump on my back. I'll take you to the other side. (laughs) You know he can do it, but you're not about to place active trust in this person, are you? (laughs) We know from the scriptures who Jesus really, really is and what he came to do, and that's essential but insufficient. You're supposed to know who he is and what he came to do and put your trust in him to do it for you. That is the essential difference, see? Active trust. The text goes on to say in verse 1, his mercy endures forever. Get the force of that. If Christ's mercy endures forever, it must mean that the recipients of his mercy will endure forever also. We don't just sort of evaporate when we die. We don't disintegrate, or we don't get absorbed into some amorphous blob, as in Hinduistic religion. No, you're still going to be you in eternity future. You're going to be you. You're going to be special. You're going to be individual. You're going to be identifiable. And you'll have very special recognition, rewards, and privileges tailored to who you are. In God's economy, this is how he does it. You will endure forever. And friends, you know what we call that? We call that eternal life. And that is worth celebrating. That's worth talking about, thinking about, rejoicing in, and sharing with others, isn't it? I think so. Look, please, at verse 2. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, His mercy endures forever. We have three groups of people mentioned here. Israel, the nation, the commonwealth of Israel. Let them say God's mercy endures forever. And then the house of Aaron, who are those guys? Those are the ministers, those who are are ministering in the tabernacle and later the temple. Those are the religious people that, that are called by God for special privileges and responsibilities within the commonwealth of Israel. And then we have those who fear the Lord. Who are those guys? Well, these are Gentiles who have attached themselves to Israel. God has moved them to believe that their God is the God of gods, and these guys are called proselytes of righteousness. And this is just one of many, many verse passages that remind us that God is concerned about everybody. The scope of salvation encompasses the whole world. God was in Christ reconciling what? The world to himself. God is concerned about everybody, as I read the Bible. Look at verse 5 now, please. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's a great question. If God's on your side, who can be against you? No one. God with one is a majority always. Isn't that true? I think we can give this little verse passage here, verses 5 and 6, present-day application I think this maps on pretty good to our conversion experience, don't you? We were distressed. I was very distressed over my sinful condition. When I discovered who Jesus really, really was, who God really, really is, what God expects of man, how far from God's glory I had fallen, how dreadful my condition was, and how powerless I was to remedy the horrible situation I was in, I was distressed. I think that comes with your conversion experience. That has to come first. You've got to mourn and be troubled about your sin. You should mourn for sin. You've got to think about who you've offended. It's terrible. I mean, you've got to pass through that kind of awful time as you realize who you are, what your condition is. Like Isaiah the prophet, remember him? He was confronted with the holiness of God there in the third heaven. He said, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. People are in distress, you see, over their sinful condition and over the relentless pangs of a guilty conscience and over fear of death that's coming and the coming judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this a judgment. These things became a reality in my life. And I threw myself on the mercy of God. I called upon the name of the Lord and I was saved. That's your redemptive history too, isn't it? 
The details differ, but in the main, this is how it happens. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. There's only one name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, and that's the the beautiful name of Jesus. I said, Lord Jesus, save me. I believe you are what the Bible says you did for me, what the Bible says you did. I receive you today as my Savior and Lord. Wash me clean. Walk with me. Make a place in heaven for me, Lord, please. I prayed a prayer something like that and never recovered. Changes everything. Changes your whole perspective, doesn't it? Your whole life trajectory changes. And we have good days and we have bad days, but you're never going back to what you were, ever. New creatures created in Christ Jesus for good works. The old is gone, the new has come. That's my story, that's yours too. We were delivered from the power of darkness and we were conveyed into the kingdom of God's dear son. And that's it, from darkness to light. By the way, what is the kingdom? I want to talk a little bit about the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Anyhow, what is a kingdom? The kingdom is just any realm in which a king exercises legitimate authority. That's a kingdom. Any realm in which there's a king exercising legit authority. I'd like to say that the kingdom of God is much more than that. The kingdom of God is not just a place where God is boss. The kingdom of God is a place of maximal freedom and safety and security. It is a broad place. Did you see that? In uh, verse 5, I called on the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. I think... There's something here. I think there's New Testament application to this. We were called out of darkness and brought into God's kingdom, which is a broad place. I want to read just very quickly what the Lord says in John 10 about him being a good shepherd. This is John 10, and I'm just going to read the Lord's words here. John 10, 1, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, note that. He leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. In my mind, we were all in a place of darkness and confinement, before we knew the Lord in a redemptive way. And at just the right time, he called us out and into his kingdom. You don't leave this borderless place of freedom to enter the kingdom, which is this small little confined thing that you're walking into. No, it's opposite. You leave a place of darkness and confinement to go into a broad place, the kingdom of God. Maximal freedom. Maximum protection. Security. The Lord leads them out into that place. He's he's in front of them, you see. The good shepherd does that. Jesus said in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John, the Baptist. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Get the idea of people funneling out of this confined, dark place. They're funneling out into the broad place. But the way out is very narrow, Narrow is the way and difficult, Matthew 7 says. There's only room for the redeemed. His worldly loves, his sins, his material possessions, all of it has to stay behind. There's just room for the redeemed person to squeeze through. That's it. That's why Jesus said it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom. It's about as easy as a camel passing through the eye of a needle. You can't take your sin with you. Can't take your worldly loves and desires. Can't take your selfishness with you. You can't. You've got to leave it all behind. It all gets scraped off as you pass through the gate. And, and you enter the broad place, see? And his apostles were absolutely astonished. What do you mean it's hard for a rich man to enter heaven? What do you mean? These people thought that if you're rich, it must mean that you have a good spiritual report card with God. God is blessing you. We have health and wealth, prosperity, gospel heretics who teach like that, don't, don't we? And Jesus said, oh, no, you got this wrong. (laughs) Just because you're healthy, wealthy, and prosperous does not mean you have a good spiritual report card with God. As a matter of fact, you might lapse into a perceived self-sufficiency that will prevent you from believing the gospel, prevent you from acknowledging your great need under God. And the apostles were astonished. They said, well, who can be saved? If the rich aren't going to get saved, who can be? 
You know what the Lord said? Matthew 19, 25 and 26. With men, this is impossible. Thank you. That's it. That's a categorical statement. You cannot save yourself. We cannot make ourselves acceptable to a holy God. Impossible. It doesn't matter how many pilgrimages you make, how many good works you do, how, many, how much uh, tithing you're going to do to the local church, whatever. It, ca- it won't help you. You won't make one inch of progress in entering the kingdom. There's only one thing needful, friends. One thing. The Bible insists on this in the clearest terms. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. Call on the name of Jesus. Receive him on faith. And he'll save you. On the spot, he'll save you. He'll change you. He'll cleanse you. He'll give you a new hope, new purpose, new history even, and new future. One thing, needful, Jesus Christ, the simplicity of Christ. Paul says, oh, I worry for you, Corinthians, that your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity of Christ. Believe in Jesus. It's the only way. With men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Even reconciliation to a holy God, even the redemption of fallen men, even those things are possible with God. But friends, I just want to remind us that that narrow way that we funnel through to enter the broad place, the kingdom, that narrow way is a living, personal agent, and his name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. I am the way, he said. I am that narrow way. He is, that ga- he is the gate of heaven. He is the door. That's it. He is the door that leads to these blessings and to an an abundant admittance into the kingdom of God. And in that beautiful place, friends, you will find an innumerable company of angels and the souls of just men made perfect. A heavenly Jerusalem. The scriptures look ahead to the fullest and final expression of the kingdom of God, the broadest and freest place imaginable. It's called the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal state. It's how it's all going to turn out, you know, for God's people. The Bible begins with two solid chapters describing a very good world that gets smashed and destroyed in chapter 3. The Bible ends with two solid chapters about how it's all going to turn out. Two solid chapters to describe a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness forever and the tree of life is there for the healing of nations and there's no more curse and there's no night and there's no darkness. There's just... Holy people confirmed in holiness and righteousness. The new heavens, the new earth. And a beautiful image of the capital city of heaven, New Jerusalem, a colossal city, like 1,500 miles square, coming down out of heaven like a bride adored for her husband. And John saw it happen, Revelation 21, and this awesome, beautiful city that I believe Jesus has gone to prepare for us. He said, I went to prepare a place for you. This is it. It touches the earth. At long last, the tabernacle of God is with men. And the beautiful city has 12 foundations, each one named after an apostle, and 12 gates that are never closed, each one named after one of the 12 patriarchs. A distinction, a beautiful distinction between Israel and the church that persists into eternity. Don't try conflating Israel and the church. They're different things. The capital city of heaven has a beautiful visual demonstration of this fact. See? Twelve gates, friends, that are never closed. Why? Because there's no threat out there. And you come and go as you please. It's a place of maximal freedom. No nighttime, no darkness, only the personal radiance of God's own glory, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's Hebrews 1.3. Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory and the express image of his person. Christ himself lightens the city. The mind boggles. The imagination just can't stretch this far. But he's going to be there, and you and I will be there, and we will be satisfied. At long last, we will be satisfied. And fallen, unredeemed men walking in darkness, they scoff at all this. They think this is foolishness that we believe this stuff. You know that? Did you know there are people who scoff at the Bible? I know it's shocking. Shocking to hear. (laughs) Well, friends, the Bible has an answer for this one, too. And it's in the very psalm that we're reading. Please read verse 8. Drop down, please, to verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. You know, friends, when God's word and human opinion come into conflict, 
It is God's word that needs to be believed and obeyed. Now, that's fine, of course, when we agree with God. But when we want to do something God says don't do, we will do mental gymnastics to justify doing what we know God said don't do, won't we? Or the opposite. God says, get busy and do this thing that I've called you to. We will do mental gymnastics, backward somersaults, to justify why we're not getting busy and doing it. <laughs> See, the Bible is the heart and mind of God given to fallen men. And guess what? It steps on everyone's toes, mine too. This, um, this idea of uh, don't resist an evil person. You know, this, if someone slaps you, turn your cheek. I got a hard time with that. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> Just being honest. I'm being honest with you. There are, there are commandments like that that I have a real hard time with. But when push comes to shove, at the end of the day, I have to submit to the known will of God, even if it costs something. And it will cost something. And when God says something and it conflicts with your mental or moral sensibilities, you have a Calvary now. God's will, your opinion and desires. There they, now we have an intersection. We have a cross. We're to get on and, and die, is what the Bible calls us to. You lose your life for Christ's sake and for the gospel's sake. Jesus said, you'll find it. You'll find it. But you save your own life, you'll lose it. This is the hard teachings of the Bible that we're called to think about, seriously. Our verse passage here said, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Yes, all men, all men, even friends who care. You have, un you have unsaved friends who care about you and they give you counsel? When what they say conflicts with God's word, you have to side with God. See? It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. This is the most capable among us, the most educated, the people with the most degrees, the most impressive, or those in authority sometimes, the government even. When they say things that conflict with what God has clearly said, you, you and I must side with God every time, see? Because, friends, no one cares about us more than God. No one knows more than God. No one has as much authority as God. We must side with God. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 62, men of high degree are a lie. There are no men of high degree. There are no great men. There's only a great God who gives gifts to men severally as he wills, certain privileges and responsibilities in the world. There's only a great God. There are no great men. There are no men of high degree. The Bible says in Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. That's where it has to start. I really mean this. I'm so big on this. This is not time filler stuff, what I'm saying now. This is really important stuff. And I mean it, literally. Our quest for real wisdom, real knowledge, and real moral uprightness, our quest for these noble things begins with recognizing the God of the Bible as our ultimate reference point, our ultimate authority, his word, the final court of appeal. Has to be, or we will not make one inch of progress in any of these noble pursuits. You can't. You've got to have that ultimate point of reference. It's God. It's his word. His word, his heart on the matter, see? And I want to say this. This is not just with respect to religious things. People in the church have a terrible problem with this. They create an artificial distinction. They say, well, in religious things, we'll let God's word speak to, to some of this. But it, when it comes to day-to-day -day affairs, science, history, philosophy, morality, whatever, well, we'll just let our sensibilities guide us. Or we're pragmatic. Whatever seems to work, we'll just side with that, see? No, absolutely not. God, God's word is the ultimate court of appeal, the final authority in matters of doctrine and theology and in home and family and in our occupations and in the sciences and in history and in government and politics 
and economics and education and art and industry and over every last single solitary speck of human experience, God's word has got to reign supreme. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He has the name above every name. Everything that is named in the created order has a name that's infinitely beneath the name Jesus. And everything is to come under the lordship, headship of Jesus. And we don't always do that. I don't always do that. Just be honest. We say, well, Lord, make the changes in me that need to be made so that I do this more. And that's part of, the, that's part of our responsibility as a redeemed community to help each other with this, to call each other back to the bar of Scripture so we don't end up meandering out there in darkness, not making progress, see? Now, I'm going to close us off today, dear saints, in the book of Ephesians, the epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4. And this is a pretty good summation of what we're talking about today. Ephesians 4. You could turn there. And I'm not going to offer all kinds of commentary on this. I think I'll just read it. And I'll close us off with a prayer. But uh, let's go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And um, we're going to put in at verse 17 here. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. Okay, so now you know what's coming is not Paul's opinion. He's in the Lord when he's given us this stuff. This is coming from the Lord. He's under Christ's control. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Yes, Psalm 94, 11. Remember that one? God knows the thoughts of man, that they are vanity, useless. I mean, unaided human reason, autonomous human reason, waste of time. It'll get you nowhere. Verse 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, no kidding, in 2023, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That's where you start. That's ground zero. Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus. He is the one in whom are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You don't need to go any further. Go to Jesus with everything, for everything. It's all there. One thing needful. Friends, I'm going to close us off on that note and uh, then uh, a final song. And then Pastor Gilbert will come. Dear Lord, this little community of blood-bought saints, we join hearts now, and we come to your throne of grace together. And Lord, we want to tell you in Jesus' name how grateful we are that you gave us the Bible. Thank you that there's something solid in this world. There's something unchangeable, something irrevisible, something dependable that we can hang on to. There are promises in your holy word given to us by a God who is faithful and true. Lord, please guard our hearts and minds that we don't stray from the words of truth, the words of certainty. Lord, we thank you that the truth that you have revealed to us just so happens to be good news, the best news we've ever heard, ever will hear. Thank you that there's a God in heaven who looked down with grace and favor even on fallen men who came into the world in the person of his beloved son, Jesus, to shed his blood to pay our sin debt in full. And he rose again for our justification and calls men everywhere to repent, receive forgiveness and salvation. Lord, thank you that that's our redemptive history, and now we're called into a mighty marching army of the living God to take down strongholds, to shine light into darkness, to set captives free of the bondage of sin and guilt and shame, fear of death and of judgment. Lord, there's a great liberation movement underway, and you've called us to be part of this. Lord, we can hardly believe that you would take simple people and call us into something so important. Find us faithful, O God, for your glory and for the good of those that you love. Even in the last of days, may it be so. In Jesus' precious and beautiful name, amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you all, dear church family.